Hello, everyone. My name is John Garcia. I am an intern at the Presidio Archaeology Lab. And my name is Reina Inlo, and I am also an intern at the Presidio Archaeology Lab. Thank you again for everyone joining us. This video was a few months in the making, and I have uh, my fellow intern Reina and the other archaeology folk to thank for this, as well as the BASF people for putting this together. Um, the video is about 14 minutes long, and if you may have to mess with audio, their audio on the computer, we tested it just now, but it was it seemed fine for everyone so far. Um, uh, yeah, I think we're I think we're ready. Mm -hmm. yeah. So grab your popcorn, grab a put on your seatbelt. It's not that intense, but let's see. I had to remind myself how to, how to share my screen. So just a second. Okay. We would like to acknowledge that the Presidio of San Francisco is in the traditional territory of the Elamu Ohlone, who lived here in the local village of Petlanuk long before California was Spain, Mexico, or the United States. The process of colonialism is still ongoing for the many indigenous people who live in the Bay Area today, and we encourage you to keep this in mind throughout the video. Welcome to the Presidio of San Francisco, a military post turned national park at the foot of the Golden Gate Bridge. Today, we are going to take you along the journey of an artifact at the Presidio Archaeology Lab and give you a tour of our facility. The journey will follow a fragment of an early American era porcelain plate as it moves through the archaeological processes from excavation to curation. We practice archaeology to tell the stories of people in the past. Here at the Presidio, archaeology helps to give a voice to those people of history whose perspectives were not included in the historical record. When archaeologists find artifacts, things left behind by humans, it is like finding missing puzzle pieces from the past, which help us fill the blanks. In order to make sure no pieces of the puzzle are missed, we have to put each artifact through a long process in our lab. This is so we can preserve and keep good records about what we find. These lab processes are what you will see today. As we piece these stories together, it is important to us to share them with the public. That's you, so welcome to our tour. The Presidio Archaeology Lab is not just a place, but a team of scientists, from whom you will be hearing today. Carrie Jones is our head archaeologist, and we have two archaeology specialists and two archaeology interns. Liz Melliker is our curator, we are also lucky to have the help of our 150 volunteers who help us through some of these lab processes. Here at the Presidio, our main research site is called El Presidio de San Francisco, the remains of the original fort at the heart of the park. To understand our artifact, you'll need to know a little bit about El Presidio. In 1776, just days before the Declaration of Independence was signed in New England, Spanish colonists arrived to build a fort or Presidio, on the bluff just above the Yalamu Ohlone village of Petlanuk. The Spanish built this fort to guard the entrance to the San Francisco Bay. The goal of the Spanish colonial project was to claim Alta California for Spain. To do this, the Spanish established Mission Dolores to convert the local indigenous populations to Roman Catholicism. Presidio served as the military arm to the Spanish Crown's program of colonization policing the native population and impressing them into service for the crown. After a brief period of Mexican control, the United States Army eventually took over the Presidio in 1847, after the end of the Mexican-American War. Over the next 148 years, the U.S. Army transformed the Presidio grounds from mostly windswept dunes and scrub to a preeminent military base. The post was closed in 1994 and handed over to the National Park Service. By the 1990s, the park was transferred to the Presidio Trust for management. 
The Presidio Trust works in partnership with the National Park Service and with the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy to manage all areas of the land and visitor experience. The Presidio Archaeology Lab is a research program of the Presidio Trust. Now, let's begin following the journey of an artifact. An archaeological artifact is an object that was modified or manufactured by humans and begins its journey when it is first created and continues when it gets deposited in the earth. A grouping of artifacts make up an archaeological site. Archaeologists working at the Presidio excavate, or dig, very carefully and slowly to uncover artifacts to help them discover the stories of the past. During excavation, related artifacts are often found at the same depth in the earth, forming what is called a context, or a layer in the ground that is associated with a specific period or time in history. There can be multiple contexts in each excavation. For example, here we have a soil profile that portrays different soil layers in the earth, where each layer is tied to a specific time period with correlating artifacts. The top layer in our profile shows the most recent material from the U.S. military occupation of the Presidio, while an older, deeper layer contains Ohlone material. The excavation process is not just digging in layers, but also meticulous documentation. We record all the information we can by making maps, taking notes, as well as photographs, because when an archaeologist excavates, they are actively destroying the site. This is because you can only dig a hole once. At the Presidio, each context we excavate is assigned a unique number and flagging tape, which helps archaeologists identify and keep track of contexts and the artifacts within them. This careful documentation is important both for future research endeavors and for preserving the site's cultural significance. Without contextual information, an artifact can lose much of its meaning or may get lost itself. An artifact by itself can only tell us so much but a group of artifacts together can help tell a more complete story. Think of them as puzzle pieces. The more you have, the better picture. The beginning of a day for our team of archaeologists starts with gathering the tools that the Presidio Archaeology Lab uses for excavation from our garage, as you can see here in the footage. We use buckets to hold excavated dirt and haul them to the lab using Gertie, our utility vehicle. She also helps us carry our tools in the morning and clean up in the afternoon. After our layers are excavated from the field and stored in context-specific buckets, archaeologists and volunteers use a process called wet screening to separate the dirt from the artifacts and rocks. Most of the artifacts are found through this screening process. Using recycled water to be as environmentally friendly as possible, our team is able to sift through each context one at a time while also giving the artifacts a preliminary wash. We would like to mention that our team is often supported by volunteers from the public who come to assist with the screening process. After our soils have been screened, all materials are brought into the indoor lab. Once all of the screen material is brought into the lab, Presidio archaeologists go through each context and sort the artifacts into general material types, such as glass, animal bone, metal, and ceramic. A more specific sorting process occurs later. The next step after initial sorting is to clean the artifacts by either dry brushing or washing with water, depending on what they are made of or how fragile they are. The tools used in cleaning the artifacts include brushes from various sizes like nail brushes, toothbrushes, and dental picks to clean out small crevices as seen in animal bones. After the cleaning process, the artifacts are left to dry in the lab. Once they are cleaned, the artifacts are then sorted into more specific categories. Ceramics are sorted into refined earthenware, coarse earthenware, whiteware, stoneware, and porcelain. Similarly, bones are sorted by the animal they came from, 
the majority of bones we find here at the Presidio come from cows or horses. After washing and sorting, a thorough cataloging process takes place. Artifacts are weighed and counted. They are then given a unique catalog number. An archaeologist labels the artifact bag with the site name, context, and year of excavation. And with all the previous steps completed, they are then entered into a software database called Rediscovery, where each artifact's catalog number is linked to information about the artifact, information including its location of discovery, context layer, weight, count, any noticeable details, and a general description. In other words, a digital version of all the previous documentation that's been done on it from the dig site and the lab up to this point. Throughout the cataloging process, it's not uncommon to discover new artifacts at this stage. For example, this French Phoenix button, a button given to French soldiers stationed in Haiti around 1802, was discovered while counting bulk metal. When an artifact is found this way, it is no longer part of the bulk material it came from. It is then given its own catalog number and record in rediscovery. With all the documentation that could be associated with it based on previous information documented from this context. If documentation was not performed throughout the process, then the button would have lost its context. Now it's time for each catalog number to get a photo on its own. Our lab has a dedicated photo station where specific tools are needed and ready at the station, like a ruler and a color card that helps future researchers interpret the artifacts in the photo, such as their correct colors and dimensions. Lighting is also very important, and our station has dedicated photo op lights to assist this. The more detailed artifacts, like the Phoenix button, have multiple photos taken to show the intricacies of the design. Each photo is put in its respective catalog record and rediscovery. This is for future research reference so that people don't have to be handling the artifacts for long periods of time. It is important not to touch artifacts too much or expose them to an environment that is not controlled so that they remain in good condition. The next step is labeling. This process requires patience. The tools we use for this step include tweezers, scissors, Q-tips, acid-free paper, acetone, and B72, which is a glue-like substance. Each artifact's catalog number must be printed in tiny font on special paper. Then the archaeologists will cut out the numbers to paste onto the artifact itself. They must make sure that the number is not obscuring any important details. Some artifacts may be too small or the material won't allow the catalog number to be glued onto it. In this case, a tag with the catalog number is placed in the artifact bag or it can be tied onto the artifact. The reason we label this way is to avoid damaging the artifact and it is reversible if a mistake is made. After this, we let the artifacts dry and then place them back into their bags. After a context is sorted and clean, the archaeologists take a photo of an entire context, called a family photo. Using the same tools as we used in the catalog photos, all the contents of a context are laid out and photographed together and then uploaded to rediscovery for future research. These photos are taken not just for documentation, but also to get a better idea of the bigger picture of the context as a whole, a way to see differences and similarities between contexts and material types. The very last step is usually left up to museum specialists or curators. However, archaeologists can complete it too. Bringing all the contexts of the year's excavation back together the steps for final curation begin. Each artifact bag must be inspected for quality and rebagged if necessary. Each box is then placed in collections and the location is recorded in rediscovery for easy locating. After final curation, the artifact has reached the end of its journey through the lab. These processes are here to ensure the preservation of the artifact itself and the cultural heritage of past people. This journey that you followed along with allows us to learn all we can from the artifact so that we can continue learning about the past. After these thorough processes, an artifact is ready for interpretation to the public. We also carefully preserve them for the future so that the archaeologists that come after us can keep learning from them. There will always be new questions about the past, and our work is designed to keep the process of exploring history alive well into the future.
Thank you for joining us on this journey, and please join us for a Q&A session after the video. All right, well, looks like we made it. Okay, um, let's see. My apologies in the beginning, I should have mentioned that we will be having a Q&A session after the video. I know the video mentioned it, but I still feel like I should have mentioned it. If you um, have any questions, feel free to type them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen next to the participants. Um, hello, this is Edward DeHaro, one of the archaeologists here, and I will be kind of uh, asking the questions in the Q&A. So the first one I'm going to ask is, um, can you tell the age of an artifact? Yes, we can. Uh, just based on what really helps is the design and also what it is exactly. Um, Raina, would you like to add to that? Yes. Also, the layer in the earth in which you find it during excavation can tell a lot about its age as well. Right. S sometimes it's not as easy as, for example, the Phoenix button that we saw in the video. And then I also have right here. Um, for example, the words on the button itself are still very present and it can easily just be researched and when it, when it was made. Um, and I know in the, in the video, we also show we showed a point obsidian point and often those can be dated just based on the design mm -hmm. okay hi this is Rogi Biantoni I'm one of the other archaeology specialists at the trust um so the next question that we are going to ask from the Q&A section is does it take years or months to study an artifact so basically how long does it take to study an artifact hmm. that is an excellent question um, I think we have a pretty good idea in the Presidio itself of what material we're going to come across. Uh, for example, our main research excavation of Presidio uh, is mostly focusing on the 1815 era Presidio. Um, so in terms of timing, I mean, how, how would we word that? Um, I think it depends mostly on how much you want to know from the artifact, if right. also if you need to get a hold of other archaeologists from different research labs or universities, mm -hmm. maybe you don't know enough about the material type or the time that it came from. So it can depend on your own knowledge of the subject and how much you want to know. Right. We almost added this to the video, but our lab is equipped with a small research library that has reference material based on the artifacts that we tend to come across in the Presidio itself. Um, so the time, the time varies. Sometimes you can kind of tell almost immediately what something is, and other times it, it can take time. Georgie and Ed, are you guys, are you two switching? Sorry, I muted myself. Um, I just, I'm going to ask the other question, and I'm actually going to answer it myself. It is, isn't part, isn't putting stuff together part of an archaeologist's job? Um, yes and no. Um, we want to keep an artifact intact. Well, we want to see what um, what the artifact is, but we don't do any gluing or putting back together of artifacts because we don't want to damage the artifacts more than they already are. Um, oops. I actually you see my face. So, um, <laughs> here I am. So I want to see it. Job, yeah, part of our job is to put things together, but not necessarily put them back together um, because we don't know in the future new technologies can come along that we can actually get a better sense of what the artifact is based on what it's made of and things like that. So, we don't want to cause any damage now so that future archaeologists don't have a harder job. 
if that makes sense. Maybe we should have added a disclaimer in the video. We did that shot for the puzzle analogy. Uh, the artifact in that wasn't an actual artifact. It was actually, it was actually something we use for our education program. Uh, maybe we should have added that disclaimer. In case that's what you guys were referencing because we did show up, put back together earlier. Okay, so the next question that we have from the chat is, what is your favorite part about working as an intern at the Presidio? There's a lot that is my favorite. Yes, um, it's, it, it's hard to pick a top one. I could do like a top few things and not any particular order. Like, yeah, go um, ahead. I think for me, definitely the people I've gotten to work with, um, which I know sounds a little cheesy, but it's true. I love my colleagues, my fellow intern, my super, my, my supervisors, uh, location as well. The, this part of the bay is absolutely beautiful. Being able to see the bridge every day, the, the history here. Like, um, I'm from Merced, California, which is, you know, Central Valley. Um, I honestly never expected to be living, working somewhere like this. So I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, just all of it, honestly, the material itself that we get to work with, the people, the place, all of it. I would say that I really liked learning about all the lab processes that you saw in the video. Mm -hmm. um, we got to spend a lot of time with the artifacts in the lab and really dive into how they get from excavation to curation. And I would also say the people that we work with and learning so much um, from actual archaeologists that are doing this every day, it's been an awesome opportunity. All right, next question is, is anything that you discover underground and old considered an artifact? Like, for example, a two-year-old Coke bottle underground, is that considered an artifact? Um, um, or what criteria determines if it's an artifact or not, or if it's an artifact worth keeping? So for us personally, us as Presidio Archaeology Lab, the cutoff for what we consider to be historical significant, I believe, is 1891. Was that, is that the exact number, Raina, do you, do you recall? I am not sure on the exact number. Ed, can you help us out with that? Or Georgie or Carrie? Our period of archeological significance for the historic landmark does end in 1892. Ah, oh, so close. Uh, but um, I, I need to find that. I can't uh, see the question. Yeah, and I wanted to reread it. Oh, I just answered it. Sorry. Oh, I just uh, moved it. But uh, to add to that answer, um, it also depends on the significance of, it, of an archaeological artifact. For us, it's 1892. But um, for historical archaeology, it can be as young as 50 years, years ago. Or again, if it's something really important, that can also be considered an artifact. If it's two, three years ago, that was part of something that happened that was monumental, that can right. be considered an artifact. Um, it's funny when I saw when I when I read that I immediately thought of how on a research project of ours we found a Dr. Pib can from the '80s. Um, I thought about that immediately. I mean, I think it's cool, but it's not historically significant to us. I think it's cool though. Okay, uh, so the next question: What was your coolest discovery in the Presidio? Hmm. Honestly. Probably this, the uh, Phoenix button, which I found all counting metal. I don't know if you recognize, you guys recognize the same monotone voice in the video. I promise you, I tried my best to sound exciting, but I just can't, like, even if I try hard, I can't. Yeah. Uh, but that's, yeah. Raina? Yeah, I didn't personally find anything, but I would say the Phoenix button as well was, that was pretty, it was a nice surprise when John was counting the 20,000 metal pieces and then told us that he had found a button from all of that. It's yeah, 20,000, 20,500. Um, and, and we can segue from that a little that this process, it can take time. It definitely takes patience. Um, I don't know if you saw that brief picture. You know, I'm just going to get it. Hold on, give me just a second, just a second. All right, while John's doing that, um, I'll ask the next, que next question. What have you enjoyed the most about your job? This. 
So I had this in the video briefly, but I don't know if that comes up well on the camera, but these are my original notes from counting. And you can see all these, I don't know if that comes up well, all these check marks right here. Each of these is a hundred when I was counting that metal. And I believe about seven, no, it's like closer to 20,000 pieces. And I found this little piece that looks circular like a coin. I thought it was a coin at first, but yeah. Sorry, I thought that'd be worth showing. Yeah. Apologize, so, I apologize for the awful handwriting. So the question was, what is our favorite part of our job? Um, I would have to say going out and actually doing field work is probably my favorite part. And we're finally getting to do a little bit of that. But um, also the lab, I enjoy doing lab work as well. Same here as well. I think just being out in the field is definitely my favorite part of the job. Okay, uh, next question. This is very timely. Did COVID change your lab processes? And I know y'all have a great answer for this one. <laughs> uh, yes, <laughs> very, very much so. Uh, in the beginning, even though me and Rena share a living space, we weren't allowed to be in the lab at the same time. So for a while, we had to take turns being in the lab. Um, so like the actual, pro what happens to the material itself wasn't changed, but the timing of how it was performed was, was definitely changed. Yeah, we would uh, take shifts. Yeah, things were definitely slowed down. Yeah. And I also just, I'll jump in and add um, that if it were a regular um, season and we hadn't had, um, COVID, John and Reyna would have been spending the last six months out on the site of El Presidio de San Francisco, um, excavating with Edward, Georgie, and I. Um, and they haven't had the opportunity to do that. And they've been um, very good sports about it. And they've taken the internship opportunity um, to really embrace the lab processes that you're hearing about here um, and use that as their learning experience. So um, COVID really has changed you know, everything about what we do. Um, like I said, normally from April through October, we would be all together. We would be out on the archeological site and we'd be welcoming folks like yourselves um, to speak directly with us. Um, and I think I speak for all of us when I say that we're super excited about being able to talk to you tonight because um, we've all been dying um, to share uh, archeology span with the public, which is really our, um, our bread and butter. So thank you for for um, joining us. And thank you to John and Raina for their, their patience um, along with the rest of us with this, um, these unusual circumstances. And Carrie, since I have you, the next question I'm gonna um, <laughs> have you answer if you can. Um, what is the oldest artifact that you have found? How old was it? That's a really good question. You know, and like uh, John and Raina mentioned and the video sort of focused um, on um, the historic archeological period. So the period after um, 1776, when we have a historical record after the um, Spanish arrived at the Presidio. Of course, um, as we acknowledge at the beginning of the film, um, we also have um, a pre-contact presence um, in the Presidio of San Francisco. So there are, um, there are actually two known archeological sites that were um, Yolamu Ohlone villages uh, on the Presidio of San Francisco. Um, and there are um, artifacts from both of those um, archeological sites that have been recovered um, as part of various efforts. And so um, some of the oldest uh, items that we have um, come from uh, Yolamu Ohlone village sites. Um, and I think the, the oldest dated artifact that we actually have um, is an obsidian um, artifact. Like John mentioned, obsidian can be dated both from um, its, uh, its style, if it's made into a projectile point, but can also be dated through something that's called obsidian hydration, which is too hard to get into right now. Um, but it, believe me, it's a highly technical archeological process that does a little bit of, of dating of obsidian. Um, and we've used that process. And we also have some, um, I know there was a question also in the Q&A about whether we ever use uh, radiocarbon dating or C14 dating, as you might uh, have heard it called. Um, and the answer is yes, um, in those pre-contact archeological sites. 
for the bulk of the work that we do on El Pacino San Francisco, we don't actually use carbon-14 uh, because when you get back a radiocarbon date, a carbon-14 date, even a really good one, um, it'll give you a date that says, you know, 700 years ago, plus or minus 250 years. And we're in historic archaeology, we're right in that plus or minus 250 years. So it doesn't do us a whole lot of good there. Uh, but the short answer to your question is the oldest artifacts that we have in the in the Presidio date to around 1300 years ago. Um, and that's from the um, Delamaloni village of um, the original location of Petlanuk is what the village was called, which was addressed early in the video. Thank you, Carrie. Question? That was great. Okay. okay, so the next question, do any artifacts get looked at again in the future? So I'm thinking this means after it gets processed and put in collections, do the artifacts get looked at again? Yes. Again, or, yeah, go ahead. Um, the reason that we keep them and usually put them in a place called collections, which is the weather controlled room to help preserve them is for future archeologists or researchers to look at the artifact and find out more from them. Also, um, yeah, I guess does that answer the question? Yeah. John, do you want to add? Think about, co think it, I think they covered it. Yeah, next, one, next question is actually two questions or two people asked them. One is how big can an artifact get and how small can an artifact get? Let's see. Um, well, hmm. I guess small, I mean, it has to be big enough for us to see. <laughs> But the smallest thing I've seen is just would be pieces of debitage, which are when you make a point, normally when you're hitting at a rock, some material comes out of that rock, you know, like not necessarily dust, but this little piece of the rock you're not going to use. That's called debitage. And I, I consider that an artifact, but they can also be huge. Like, Raina, you have an idea for me? Uh, I, I don't know. Can Ed or Georgie help us on this one? Um, well, I would like to add, because I am a paleoethnobotany nerd, which means I study plants from the archaeological record, that some really, really small things that we can study are plant seeds that you can only see with a microscope. So, debitage can be really small, plants can be really small. Um, there's a lot of artifacts that actually do require a microscope to see and identify. So, that is a really great question. Um, Ed, do you have uh, an artifact on the opposite end of the scale, something really big? Oh uh, yeah, so like um, Georgie mentioned, she's a paleoethnobotanist. One of my specialties is uh, faunal analysis. So it's like uh, analyzing animal bones. And as you can imagine, animals can get pretty big. So we haven't found any in the studio, but you know, you can look at whales, we can look at things like that. We don't necess necessarily go all the way back to dinosaurs. That's more of a paleo uh, paleontology um, field. So that's a little too old for me. But we do sometimes get to see bigger animals or even um, sometimes buildings can be considered archaeological artifacts mm -hmm. so they can get it's a wide range of sizes so i almost mentioned like an old piece of machinery but i wasn't sure if i should answer just based on the presidio itself or just archaeology in general um yeah like when they're or, yeah, yeah okay so um this next question i'm going to combine about three people's questions into one which is essentially um what got you interested in archaeology where did you go to school? What kind of degree does archaeology require? Does it require graduate degrees? Um, and how did you become interns at the Presidio? Um, so I, I was always interested in archaeology when I was little, but I didn't really think of it as a career until later on, um, halfway through college, actually. So I didn't go to a university that had an archaeology degree but I majored in history and sociology, and I found some extracurricular research and activities that helped me gain experience somewhat in archeology. span And then after I graduated, I um, found the posting for this internship and applied, and here we are. So that's my personal journey. Right. Uh, I I have a tendency to ramble, so I'm gonna like try not to ramble. Um, I've always been a fan of history, but I knew that I didn't want to be a teacher. I don't think I don't think I'd be a good teacher. Uh, so I originally majored in history at my JC, 
and I took my first anthropology course. And then I took, and in part of my anthropology, the first course is to go over archaeology as well. And I knew regardless what I wanted to do in life was that I wanted to do something that's historical. I wanted to do something that helps people. And I wanted to be, do something that's outside, like active. And archaeology kind of just fulfilled all of those check marks, honestly. Um, like I have it to thanks for seeing parts of like, in, this, in my case, parts of the country I never thought I'd see before. I, I, I had a field, an archeological field school that was 8,000 feet up in the high desert, Nevada, hours away from anyone. Like, and it was beautiful. I would never have gotten to see that if I had went, not went to the field that I got into. And then for things like that, that's why part of the, why, the reason I left the field. And again, the history part as well, working with this material is just incredible. Um, as for school, I went to, I got my bachelor's from Sonoma State University. Um, and then I found out about this position from my former mentor, Dr. Patan, uh, the head of the anthropology department at Sonoma State. And I applied and here I am today. Did that, all, did that answer all of it? Okay. Sorry if that was too long. That's actually a really good question. The next one is, does the digging and recovery of artifacts negate the future of artifacts for today being discovered in the future? Or does our current means of recording video, et cetera, lay the groundwork? So. I'll be honest, I actually didn't hear that entirely well. Yeah, I didn't either. Um, basically, we have to what, asking, we have basically to scream. what they're asking is by excavating your removing artifacts, does that, is that a uh, instrument to future archeologists? Um, well, one of the things when you're doing field work is that you have to take documentation and you have to keep um, detailed notes. You have to draw maps like you might have seen in the video. Um, right. Photography and all of this is for record keeping for the future if somebody needs to look back and refer to what has been done. Um, yeah, so for future archaeologists, but yes, it is a destructive process yeah. and you're losing, I mean, you're the only one when you're excavating that's going to see it the way that it is. Mm. Right. I think I covered it all. Yeah, it's a very destructive process. You, it, yeah, I, I covered it. I don't have anything to add. I, yeah, well, I'll add to that too, that um, it is destructive and we know that. So we, it's kind of counterintuitive, but we don't excavate if we don't have to. We have to justify our excavations um so we don't just go out and dig where we think we might find something we actually have to research and justify it before we ever touch the ground that way um we hopefully can get as many answers as we can before we destroy that area and as we're doing it we're also like george and um john arena said we're taking photos we're drawings we're doing as much documentation as we can so that future archaeologists can at least get a sense of what was there okay so we have a lot of questions. We're not going to get to all of them, but thank you so much for submitting these. But I do have one that I think is a great segue into the activity we have tomorrow. So Raina and John, you can plug that. Um, this question, have you ever found any food while you were sorting or does it usually decompose? I have not found any organic materia, material while sorting. Um, unless some, I almost did a joke, but it would have been uh, counterintuitive. Uh, Raina, would you like to add? Um, no, I haven't found any kind of organic material or food during sorting, but to plug our activity tomorrow, we have an activity called Garbology where we will be looking at um, our trash that we intend to throw away and how that can tell us about our lives. And we'll be delving into also what um, artifacts will make it into the historical record, which depends on whether they will decompose or not. So mm -hmm. that's tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. Um, and just to add to that, so that's exactly right. Things decompose, we don't find them archeologically. Most biodegradable you know, remain to our daily life. Um, but we can still find the remains of food. So for example, Ed was talking about finding bones um, because he does faunal analysis. So we can look at those and see how the food was prepared 
or what animal it came from, what people were eating. Similarly, people who study plant remains can look at how, uh, what um, plant foods people were eating. And also the shape of ceramics, for example, so plates and bowls, that can also tell people, um, tell us what people were eating. So we don't find food itself most of the time, but we can find clues that point towards food, which is great because everyone eats, so food's really important. <laughs> All right, I think we have a couple more minutes. So um, quick question, how many artifacts have we found? In terms of individual object, many, but I know in terms of individual artifact numbers, these little catalog numbers we have, similar to how you check out a book. I believe in curation, we have 770,000 context numbers for, for artifacts. So that should give you rough. It's not, it's not necessarily one context number is one artifact. Some context records have two. Some have many. Some's a bag full of bulk material. Um, yes, we have yeah, 770,000 context, uh, not context, um, these numbers, which I'm actually surprised I remember the number of exactly. Okay, so it looks like we have one minute remaining. Um, Quick last question I want to pose, and I think Carrie, maybe you'll want to take this one, is how do people volunteer uh, at the Presidio Archaeology Lab? That's a great question. Hopefully we have some uh, prospective volunteers in our audience. Um, the short answer right now is that you can, vol you can email volunteer at presidiotrust.gov. Um, and like we showed in the video, um, we have volunteers help us with any number of um, tasks, including screening, sorting, a lot of the lab processes that you saw today. Um, and what we're hoping um, as a team is that we'll be um, everything going well back out into the field um, in 2021, just as soon as we possibly can. Um, and so if you, if you email uh, volunteer at they'll put you on a list. Um, and we will contact you as soon as we have um, volunteer opportunities. Yeah. I, um, if, if I could borrow a few seconds, I actually saw a clarifying question. I'd like to take a second to answer. That's all right with everyone. Someone asked what company, uh, when did our company start? And I'd like to clarify that specifically, we work for a government agency called the Presidio Trust, which is a federal agency similar to the National Park Service which was specifically created to oversee the interior of the Presidio of San Francisco in the late 90s after the U.S. Army left the Presidio. Just, for, just in case anyone thought we were a business or, you know, um, yeah. Yeah, thanks, John. Yeah, so we, we're, um, we're a federal agency um, and we're a program of that federal agency, the Archaeological Research Project in the Presidio Archaeology Lab is a program of the Presidio Trust and we're funded by the Presidio Trust. I'm happy to answer any more questions if anyone has, but we gotta wrap up then. I yeah, think we're out of time here. Sorry, John. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all for joining all right. us today for thank this you, everyone. Journey of an Artifact Tour. We hope to see you all tomorrow for the activity in the morning. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, and we hope to see you out on the archaeological site or at the archaeology lab, um, hopefully in 2021. Thank you, everyone.